Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. And uh, I'd like to first uh, start by thanking Don and Dan for actually inviting me to give this talk. It's my privilege to be talking about something which is very dear to my heart, which is primary prevention of stroke, uh, specifically stroke risk in the South. So uh, those are my disclosures. Uh, I currently have an ongoing trial, which I'll briefly talk about uh, in prevention of secondary stroke, not primary stroke. But uh, So uh, usually I like to start off by uh, addressing how the definition of stroke has changed over the last decade or so. Uh, and I think we all know, I don't need to address to this crowd, that we learned in med school that stroke is generally a uh, sudden onset neurological disorder, vascular origin. If it's less than 24, it's a TIA, uh, and if it's more than 24, it's a stroke. Around 2009, I think people realized that was not sufficient. We had MRI scan to confirm stroke, specifically uh, uh, imaging formality called diff diffusion weighted image. And based on that, the definition changed that it had to be confirmed on imaging with an evidence of infarction. So uh, if somebody's symptom got better, even within those 24 hours, but the MRI scan shows a stroke, by definition, that's a stroke. Okay, so uh, by definition, by that definition, uh, an MRI, uh, TIAs have to be MRI negative. But again, I think uh, stroke is broadly categorized, we all know, into ischemic and hemorrhagic. It happens that the more common form is the ischemic stroke and the less common form hemorrhagic stroke with, with more complications and mortality and morbidity. Um, but even within that, I think it's, uh, as a neurologist, we have figured out that, that it's important not to lump all strokes into one bucket. Okay, even within that ischemic stroke, there's a little bit of difference whether that stroke is coming from the heart, cardiomyopathy, if atrial fibrillation and being a common reason, or is it coming because of a carotid stenosis, large artery atherothrombosis, or is it a small vessel disease? And all the rest have been lumped into groups called cryptogenic and other. There have been a variety of classifications which kind of define each of these subtypes. Uh, the, mo the original one was called as a TOAST classification. Since then, there has been a lot of modifications which use imaging, MRI scan, work up to kind of make those determinations. Hemorrhagic stroke, uh, broadly categorized into those which bleed into the brain, intracerebral hemorrhage, or around the brain, subarachnoid hemorrhage. But even there has been advances made in that, that group of stroke patients. There is a classification system uh, more widely used in Europe, less used in the US, called the SMASHU classification, which actually divides that hemorrhagic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage, into buckets, okay? Uh, the most common one being hypertensive, but there is coagulopathy, abnormal vessels, there is drug use, so it has a lot of, and they've shown that, based on that, we can actually prognosticate stroke patients. So we just saw the map, how the map had changed for cerebrovascular disease. And this is just reiteration of the same thing. We are in the, what we call as the buckle of the stroke belt. That includes states like North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So what makes this the buckle of the stroke belt? And it's just largely to do with the fact that there's a very high prevalence of those stroke risk factors in the South. Okay, um, and I like to address the modifiable risk factors first and then move on to the non-modifiable a little bit, okay? Uh, so, so in terms of modifiable risk factors for ischemic stroke, a lot of this data comes from a study, uh, which is a po population, southern population-based cohort study called as REGARDS, uh, run by George and Virginia Howard from uh, Alabama, and a lot of the things I'll be presenting is coming from the REGARDS study. Now, the REGARDS study has had multiple publications, I did not list them individually, but I wanted to kind of go over some of them we know very well, hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, the common ones, but some unique ones too, 
Um, they did uh, note that in the south, air pollution and arsenic levels were related to stroke risk. Uh, they also found that diet and physical activity, uh, uh, body weight, body fat, okay. They also noted sleep disturbance. Uh, less sleep as well as increased sleep, both were risk factors for ischemic stroke. In terms of diet, they, had a, they have a paper which specifically indicated in the south, uh, people eat, do tend to eat a lot of fish, but it is fried fish, okay? And they related the stroke risk to consumption of fried fish. Um, and last but not the least, which we always kind of fail to uh, remember is the newly diagnosed cancer population. And I think it's very important to realize that they are at high risk for stroke and might be candidates for thrombo profile access as soon as cancer is diagnosed. Uh, in, the, in, in the regard study, they also showed that uh, in hemorrhagic stroke, we obviously uh, uh, know that elevated systolic blood pressure is a risk factor for intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, they also noted in the south that oral anticoagulant use was linked with ischemic, uh, with hemorrhagic stroke risk. Uh, in the regard study, they did measure factor nine level uh, and, and among other factors which were either pro or, uh, or hypocoagulant. And they did note that decreased factor nine level was seen more with the folks who had intracerebral hemorrhage. So touch upon a little bit about the non-modifiable risk factors and all of this interact with the modifiable risk factors, okay? And we probably know this already, older age, male gender, uh, African-American race, rural population are all at higher risk. Uh, I did include rural, uh, it might be considered as a non-modifiable risk factor because that's where persons live. So I'd uh, like to talk, touch upon a little bit about the prevalence of these risk factors. So I'm going to present some data which has not, we have not published it yet. Uh, we just acquired the data. So uh, one of our uh, junior colleagues at, at uh, USC School of Medicine, uh, Dr. Yala Pragada, he actually started this program called as Holy Stroke. So he uh, kind of rounded up our uh, workforce, which is the medical students who are willing to volunteer their weekends. Um, so they, they would go uh, uh, during the weekends uh, on the Sundays and actually attend the health ministry of the churches um, and predom predominantly African-American churches. So in determining uh, kind of a fancy name, we, we decided to call that as the Holy Stroke Program. With a, we came up with a nice logo and we started the program about one year back. Since then, we have had several of these uh, church sessions where we would go in there and actually measure the risk factors uh, and, and actually educate the folks about those risk factors. Um, and, and this is about the first 400 plus patients gathered from 12 churches in that uh, one year period. And as you see, if you look at the averages of all the risk factors, you see what the problem is, okay? These are folks who haven't had a stroke, okay? Uh, and the BMI, you see that, that's the average BMI, okay? You see the blood pressure range, this is a, quite a young population. Most of them were within that uh, 18 to 45 range, okay? And you look at the blood pressure. Look at the hemoglobin A1C, it is almost in the pre-diabetic range, that's the average, okay? Um, lipids, you look at the LDL cholesterol, um, it's, it's kind of, they fall in this dyslipidemic range. So it gives you an idea that the prevalence of these risk factors is quite bad in even the patients who haven't had stroke yet. If you look at the demographics, that might be a little hard to read, but if you look at the demographics, as we said, it was predominantly um, African-American churches, uh, pre predominantly males, um, and uh, can't read this. So uh, this is an important thing, which is, uh, which was we are pleasantly surprised. Most of these folks were, uh, who had health insurance, okay, but had not seen a primary doctor. So which was to me a very, very, very disturbing trend. You cannot blame it on lack of care, access to care, lack of insurance as a reason why they 
hadn't seen a primary doctor. These guys had not seen a primary doctor. And we provided them with a report and asked them that they did need to seek a primary doctor. So uh, if you look at blood pressure, you see, the, see this, that uh, in the African-American population, there was a predominantly high rate of <coughs> hypertension and prehypertension. Okay. Um, and if you look at the BMI, uh, it was, there was a gender predisposition to higher levels of obesity ranges of BMI. And if you look at, again, BMI, the African-American community, there was a higher rate of obesity and overweight uh, category in, in the African-American compared to the smaller number of Caucasian population which we evaluated. And if you look at the interaction between age and all of this risk factor, there was some kind of an interaction, which is, for example, you look at A1C, as one gets older, that, that's the hemoglobin A1C was higher in the southern population. Uh, PMI kind of across the board, it was in the more towards the overweight obesity range. And you look at blood pressure. So here's a population 18 to 44 again. Uh, look, at, look at the blood pressure. So it is already in the in the range, and these are, a lot of these folks were not taking any medications, had not seen a primary doctor. So in the regard study, they also looked at potential actionable items and what could we do about it, and they linked it directly with the stroke risk, which is interesting. So they looked at, number one, they looked at medication adherence, and specifically adherence to antihypertensive medication. And they noticed that low medication adherence, if they were hyper, non-hypertensive, was linked with ischemic stroke as well as hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, we know from, for stroke population that the Mediterranean <coughs> diet is probably the best in terms of reducing the risk of ischemic stroke. And they found that the adherence, low, medic, low adherence to the Mediterranean diet was also associated more specifically <coughs> with ischemic stroke risk. Low physical activity, low daily activities were also linked with it. And they summarized this very well in a, another, st another analysis of the REGARD study where they looked at the Life Simple 7, which included all these major risk factors. And they found that decreased adherence to any of these uh, or decreased uh, compliance and treatment of these were associated with a higher risk of ischemic stroke. So uh, I like to kind of think ahead. Uh, so <coughs> does this high prevalence of risk factor in the South explain that whole stroke belt phenomenon? <coughs> and the answer is no. Uh, what they found is when you adjust for all these risk factors, okay, there's a still approximately a 40% of that risk which is not explained by these risk factors, which means there is a definite need for further research into why this is the stroke belt. So we can explain 60% based on that high prevalence of uh, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, physical activity, all of that. But 40% we cannot explain. With that in mind, I like to kind of uh, move towards a little bit about my own research, which is, um, to, uh, tooth loss and gum disease. Okay, from the REGARD study, this has been published, uh, which is that tooth loss and gum disease was associated with high risk of stroke. Now, one might say that somebody who does not see a dentist also does not see a primary physician too. Okay, so this might be confounded by demographics and socioeconomic status. But look at this, this last column is actually adjustment for demographic, socioeconomic status, and risk factors. And the tooth loss was still st significantly associated with that, um, with that stroke risk. And uh, so uh, I like to kind of focus because a lot, all of us are aware at looking at patients' mouth and looking for gum disease. Just to give a little bit of an overview, what is gum disease? It's, the, it's essentially, this is what a healthy gum looks like. Okay, very nice healthy margin. And actually when they stick this probe <coughs> called as a UNC probe, you can see that the depth is typically less than, uh, it's a few millimeter, one or two millimeters. And on the panorex, there is no bone loss. Uh, 
um, uh, as opposed to gum disease, which is the, you see this recession of the gum line. There's a little bit of bleeding around the edges. You might see some plaque buildup. And look at this pocket depth. Uh, it is typically four, five, or more millimeters. Very important uh, to know that this has been linked with ischemic stroke, heart disease, you name it, cardiovascular disease. So we published this earlier this year, uh, which is uh, results from the ARIC database, which is again uh, 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 predominantly involves the southern population, where we, in the ARIC database, which is about, uh, it's a cohort study of uh, approximately 15,000 subjects followed for almost 25 years. In one of the visits of ARIC study, um, they were assessed for, did they see the dentist at least once every six months, okay? Or did they not, okay? And then we have 25 years data of incident stroke. In the ARIC study, what we found was those who visited uh, the dentist at least uh, sought dental care once every six months had a lower risk for ischemic stroke. And that stayed significant even after adjustment of all the risk factors as well as socioeconomic status. However, I think one, the, the, the scientist would say that this is not a randomized clinical trial. It's an observational study. So approximately four years back, um, I, uh, we, uh, I, uh, at uh, USC, jointly with UNC, we embarked on this clinical trial called as PREMIERS. Uh, it is not the same as primary prevention. Uh, sorry, this slide doesn't have anything to do with PREMIERS, but I'll, I'll get to the slide. Uh, so in the PREMIERS trial, what we're doing is, Every stroke patient that comes into our stroke unit, the dentist actually screens them in the stroke unit, okay? And we check for gum disease, and if they have gum disease, they're randomized into intervention arm versus standardized care, and they're followed for one year period of time. And the goal is to see, does that help prevent future strokes or not? And I think that might provide that evidence which we need to show that gum disease is truly linked with, and it's not the other confounders such as socioeconomic status, access to healthcare. Last, I would like to kind of point out that we did this study uh, approximately a couple of years back. Uh, we looked at the patients primarily out of our stroke unit, and we had the case control study. We matched it with age and gender matched population, and we found a very strange phenomenon which has been reported by other other uh, researchers also, which is the stroke population in the South have shown to have some evidence of epigenetic modification. So that's where I think the environment meets the genes and might contribute to that stroke risk factor. And that is getting into the little into that 40% where we cannot explain why, why the stroke belt exists. And uh, finally, I'd like to conclude by uh, just throwing a little bit of a pitch for, uh, we have the South Carolina Neurology Association which meets annually, and the next one is really focused on uh, neurology for, uh, uh, for the emergency room patients, and just like to kind of throw a little bit of pitch. At